Hi, beautiful people. We are here. I'm Shamaya. It's like papaya, except it's not. And this is Plot Twist, Please, a place where I like to talk about media literacy, ASD wellness, anti-oppressive wellness methods. So how are y'all doing today? I am excited because I'm using clearly my new microphone. I think the sound quality is going to be so much better. I have my like focus right. Um adapter, converter, what what Jimmy call it thing. And I can put the links to those in the description if y'all want to look at them. But yeah, let me know if you want to look at them. Let me know in the comments if you want to see the equipment I'm using because I just got new equipment and so I'm feeling like a real like podcasting early. Like it's, we up in here in 2023, you know. So I'm really excited. Um, I have a kind of laid back look today because I want it to be comfortable, A, because I'm in the middle of tech week, and B, because I'm wearing a wig, I'm wearing multiple wigs for the show that I'm in in the morning, and then I have rehearsal at night, and so I'm just trying to just chill a little bit, I'm just trying to let my hair be free, just let it breathe a little bit, let it soak under there with them juices, you know, with the cocoa butter and the... Or not cocoa butter. Oh, Lord. With the shea butter. Please don't be putting cocoa butter in your hair. I mean, I don't know what works for you, but it does not. that's not something that I can entertain. Really? Um, but I've been using coconut oil and this shea butter thing. Um, like this, I don't know what it's called. But I've been using that. And so it's been really helpful. And so I'm just kind of letting it all soak in there. I'm letting it all marinate. Like, um... Like, uh, you know, it was cooking in a little crock pot. If you want to hear more, you know, in-depth details about my life, you know, how I go about dating as an autistic woman, as an autistic black woman, you know, in these streets. Also, Black History Month. Happy Melanin Birthday Month. Happy Black History Month. Um, But yes, so I talk about my really intimate struggles and solutions on the Patreon with things like that. I talk about my friendships more in depth. I talk about, you know, uh, very specific ways that I try to orchestrate my life to make it the most efficient and fulfilling for me as a black autistic woman in America. And um, as an actor also, as an artist and business person. So if you wanna hear all about that, you can go ahead and become a patron. And I also just kind of go off the cuff there and really just let my freak flag fly. But you can also just stay here and listen to this episode if you'd like. I won't, you know, I don't dislike that option either. So today, this is going to be an extended video. I also have shorter bite-sized reaction videos and, you know, where I talk about very specific, you know, TV shows or movies or things that really jump out to me and what's going on in media. And... That's as I get ready for the day. So little get ready with me videos you can find on this channel, as well as long form podcast episodes that have more research associated with them. And they're more theoretical too, I think. Great. So now that we are all met. So something that I really wanted to talk about today was the overwhelming... I'm not going to make any judgments on it now because I'm going to make judgments on it later, but just to give you a preface of what's going on in media discussions right now. So there's a lot of, I think, fear of influencers getting paid more than doctors, more than people who are perceived to having a certain pedigree. And I understand like people questioning whether it is morally sound or whether it is harmful or what it, you know, or people are afraid of what it could potentially say about society or what it could potentially do to the labor market. The fact that there are a lot of influencers who used to be medical professionals or lawyers. It's not necessarily the concern that people are walking away from that and becoming influencers, but it's, it's I think, more of a fear of what I've gathered. It's more of a fear that less people are even interested and becoming doctors or lawyers or, you know, meteorologists or what have you and are more interested in becoming influencers because of this new creator economy that has become really robust in the workforce. And if you are, you know, in tune to what I'm doing and to, you know, to how creators have kind of been 
becoming the main source or creator slash influencers. But see, there's there's connotation to, to both of those. And I'll get into that as well. But creator slash influencers and how a lot of businesses now, a lot of brands, large brands, you know, there's makeup on my eye. Don't worry about it. Um, but um, I think the concern is that, oh, it's pink. It's fine. I think the, <laughs> the concern is that that when you ask kids now what they want to be when they grow up, their answer is more likely than not going to be an influencer rather than a, me- a veterinarian or a pediatrician. I mean, when I was five, I wasn't, I didn't know what a pediatrician was, so I wasn't going to answer pediatrician anyway. But like someone might say, I want to be a YouTuber or I want to be a TikToker. My thesis is that there is a lot of moral panic um, and a lot of hyperbolic, I guess, concern. Like, I don't want to dismiss anyone's genuine concerns, but it just seems very hyperbolic to me because if you look at the creator market, right? And if, and basically, if you're not aware of this, the creator economy has been a large part in marketing initiatives, has been a large aspect of the workforce for quite some time now, for you know, maybe five years, it's really started to become a true source of income for some people, an emphasis on that word, some. But what I find interesting is that this fear of the sudden popularity of the influencer career path to the general person who is struggling to get by, as many of us are, on salaries that are too low for inflation rates as they are now. And, you know, for people who are overworked and underpaid, such as educators, um, such as some nurses, you know, it just, it's such as, you know, people who work in the restaurant business, people who work in service businesses, people who are essential workers, like the... uh, like you look at the workforce and you're like, oh, okay, no wonder people are think- looking for an alternative. But that aside, I thought that I'd pose the question, is this influencer fanaticism, is this influencer draw new? What I'm going to do now is I'm going to do my favorite thing and it's refer to my notes. So if we want to look at a brief history of influencer marking, We can look way back to the 1760s when King George III of the United Kingdom supported the pottery of Joseph Wedgwood, giving his royal stamp of approval, baby. Mr. Wedgwood used this awareness to sell his products and raise awareness of his brand. So yeah, 1700s, that's that's a long time ago. And even if we look at Marie Antoinette, who often wore a lot of styles that were of the newest fashion designers, and she was doing some brand promotion there. If you look at any kind of reality star in the 90s, you know, if you look at Jersey Shore, you look at Kardashians, come on. And they were mega influencers who made influencing a legitimate career path. Now, the means in which they did that are questionable, are morally dubious. But what we can acknowledge is that they, in many ways, were setting a precedent for this kind of economy in in a way that hadn't been done before. And a lot of that, I think, is due to, you know, their mama, you know, their, their momager. I do give her a lot of credit for that. Mm. Whatever issues I have with their politics is irrelevant. It, I, can, I can acknowledge good marketing when I see it. Um, you can even look at the obsession with the royal family over the years, you know, both in modern times and colonial times, how people like the general population, especially people, uh, people of a lower economic, uh, socioeconomic economic class looked up to these people. And so if they wore something, if they were designer, then that would contribute to the perception of designer, the public perception of the d- designer and perhaps to their sale. It's not like influencing is this huge phenomenon. It's not like it's this new concept. I just don't think that it's been as integrated into the workforce as it has become over recent years for more people than the Kardashians, for people who weren't born into wealth, for people who who don't have a background of, you know, having a wealth management fund or having a trust fund or having parents who could have pay for their rent. Like, 
the average Joe could do it. And that I think that's why I was really kind of bugged when Emma Chamberlain made that comment about influencing being dead. And it brought me to the statistic way back. Um, I'll link it in the description, but not statistic. It brought me to this study on how whenever black women get access to something and black women are trailblazing in the influencer industry, are setting trends, are being the culture, okay? That article was pointing out how when black women get access to something, then white women deem it as less valuable. You can look at higher education. The more black women got access to it, the less special those associations became. And it's so frustrating, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, but we have to acknowledge that it is Black History Month, so we cannot, we cannot disengage with the garbage salad of capitalism that makes it so that when Black people get access to something, then that something becomes less sought after by white people, or it becomes less palatable in a white people's eyes. Mm, it becomes less special. It becomes less elite. It becomes common. It becomes, mm, you know, like we can't, we can't ignore that. We're not going to ignore that on here. <laughs> so within that discussion of things becoming more accessible, even to them becoming depicted as common among, you know, white people or even more specifically the white elite, people with a lot of money, people with a lot of status, you know, them have become really kind of immersed in the discussion of whether or not meritocracy is valid anymore. You know, whether or not meritocracy, meritocracy even exists. And basically meritocracy, if you don't know this, meritocracy is the idea that working hard or being qualified for something allows you to access that thing, allows you to get that job or receive that degree or get that funding, or have those associations within an educational environment, or within the corporate space, or within your industry that you're working in. Like these things become very linked to how high you go within the capitalist system, how how much status you get, how much money you are able to a- earn annually. Right? The more I am faced with both anecdotal and quantitative data, the more I believe that meritocracy is dead or is becoming very obsolete on a large scale, not in everything. Like you still need a PhD to teach at a university. I mean, I think, Queen Kardashian doesn't have a PhD though. She just taught at Harvard. So I don't know y'all. And la 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 la. Um, but, um, <laughs> I do think you know, you still need a doctorate to be a surgeon. You still need credentials to fly a plane. You still need, you know, there are things you still need to do certain professions, obviously. But in a lot of ways, especially in the corporate space, oh my God, it drives me nuts, especially in the corporate space, you need connections over merit. Like it's it's over how much schooling you've done. It's over your experience. It's over how you present in the room. It is about who you know. And one can even argue that with all the pedigree, with all the credentials, with the degrees, you still need those connections as opposed to surviving and getting to where you want to be off of meritocracy alone. And you know, that's just the way it is. But I think the thing that is actually more astonishing to me, that is more shocking, is the fact that meritocracy has actually been used, or rather the concept of meritocracy has been used as a weapon against certain groups of people, particularly minorities, and particularly people who don't have access to the country clubs where you meet the CEOs, or, you know, to the box seats where you're rubbing shoulders with, you know, this and that person, or the person you would golf with on the weekends, or the person you would have, your family has dinner with every so often, like, It's different. It's different out here for different folks is what I'm saying. So so when I say that meritocracy has been used as a weapon, I I say that not just based off of experience of people in my artistic career, in the corporate space of people devaluing my expertise because of this body that I live in, you know, because of my black womanness. Um, I, I say it not only because of those experiences, 
So this was published by the Princeton University Press. Um, and, you know, we un- I understand that, uh, you know, classism is real when it comes to education. But when the credentials are there, you got to it's it's a thing. It's a thing. You know, it's a thing. And I've, I've talked about intellectualism and elitism in a former podcast episode. But I talk about it more in depth of how even like going about research is classist. But y'all wouldn't have respe- y'all wouldn't respect what I'm about to say if I didn't from the have Princeton something. University Press, you know. So we just got to work with what we got to work with. Anywho, so this is titled. A belief in meritocracy is not only false, it's bad for you. It's by Clifton Mark, and it was published in 2020, so it's very recent. Perhaps more disturbing, simply holding meritocracy as a value seems to promote discriminatory behavior. The management scholar Emilio Castilla Castilla, mm, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the sociologist Stephen Bernard at Indiana University studied attempts to implement meritocratic practices such as performance-based compensation in private companies. They found that in companies that explicitly held meritocracy as a core value, managers assigned greater rewards to male employees over female employees with identical performance evaluations. This preference disappeared. Now here, here, here we go, here we go. This is where it kind of flips. This is where you see the alternative potential method. This preference disappeared where meritocracy was not explicitly adopted as a value. So what they're saying when managers are focusing on meritocracy, when they were focusing on, you know, whether or not someone did a job well, they were had more affinity toward male employees than female employees. But when meritocracy was taken out of the equation, then there was balance. <laughs> This analysis does not necessarily in this part take into account, you know, race or diverse gender identities or ethnicities, you know, skin tone, like lots of things that contribute to implicit bias. But you could at least acknowledge from this and lots of other things from lots of other texts that bias plays a role in what we perceive as merit-based and what we perceive as good work. Or None of us are exempt from bias. I do this work a lot. I practice not having implicit bias when I'm working with kids, when I'm on the internet, when I'm interacting with people I don't know, but I still have it. I'm in an artistic field. I do this for a living. Like I deconstruct these these. Social political, social political concepts for a living, but it still gets me sometimes because it's ingrained. And the thing with meritocracy is that it really validates our sense of the status quo. Like meritocracy makes us feel safe. It makes us feel comfortable. It makes us feel good to know that if we work hard enough, then we can get everything we want. The world's our oyster if we work as hard as we can. But I do think that it is a disservice to us. It's a disservice to our mental health. It's a disservice to our physical health, to our well-being, to believe that working hard is the only part of the equation. Because if you don't get that thing that you want, you don't get the thing you, you seek after relentlessly and you're a minority, a lot of the time you'll attribute that to you not working hard enough or you... You know, if if we're you know if we're really struggling, if you're really struggling, you might attribute it to your value as a person in the world, and that's the thing too. And I had another video about this about how a lot of Americans, I think, associate or in Western society, Western society in general, I think a lot of us associate goodness and moral soundness with how hard someone works. If someone works hard, then they are intrinsically good. Then there is something about them that is value, I mean, not saying that it's invaluable, not saying that it's not a valuable characteristic to have, you know, having ambition, that's not a bad characteristic to have, I don't think, but that's not, that's not harmful at at times. But I think we also need to acknowledge, we don't know how hard someone is working, that we will perceive effort in a different way, depending on how we grew up, depending on the, you know, where we are in, culture right now how society is going whether or not we're in a recession like some people are just coming out of covid and literally are trying to survive or try to stay sane and that is taking so much effort people need to understand that like people are 
Some people are really doing the best that they can, but you won't even know that. You won't be able to tell that they're doing the best that they can because you're only working from your siloed perspective, from your individual perspective of what hard work looks like. And, you know, and even when it comes to people with disabilities, you don't know how hard someone is working to just show up to work, to just have a conversation. And so I honestly, one of the things that ticks me off, like as someone who doesn't have the biggest grasp or the best grasp on social cues, one of the things that really just like grinds my gears is when someone faults someone for not performing in a social environment the way that they should have. Like I get it if someone is just being like tyrannical and rude and mean and like a bully, like I get that and I get how that is wrong and harmful and like I get why someone might, you know, want to punish someone for that. Like I get that. But if someone is just like not answering a question the way you want them to or someone is being awkward or someone is talking out of turn, like give them a break. Like, there are people out who are hungry. Are you really focusing on whether someone's talking out of turn? Are you really focusing on whether somebody paused long enough before they spoke? Like, I, maybe I just have seen some things that just really made me mad about how people categorize other people. You don't know what someone's going through. You literally don't know. There are invisible disabilities. <laughs> invisible to you, not invisible to them. So back to the discussion of everyone wanting to become a celebrity or an influencer. For this reason, I think because of a lot of, you know, physical, cultural, socioeconomic disparities in the workforce, people have sought after influencing in order to maintain some sort of control over their lives. You saw what happened with Goldman Sachs and all those people who were laid off. Those people thought they were set probably for life. People are getting laid off every day at high end jobs who have worked for years to, to be in those positions. Followed from stories that I've heard, I think most of the people who were laid off, you know, in this past year from large corporations were people under the age of 30. So does it surprise you that these people are seeking alternative income methods? Does it surprise you? If you've been sought, if you've been sold, right? This, this tale that meritocracy was going to get you the life that you want. And then it, when you sign the lease for this house, um, when you sign that lease, and you go into work for the first, you know, the second week you've been there and you learn that day, not two weeks in advance, not a week in advance. You learn that morning when you slide your card in that you're fired, that you've been let go and you still have rent to pay for that month on that lease that you just signed for that job you thought you'd have. Why does it surprise people that people are seeking influencing as a way out? Why does it surprise people that meritocracy seems fake? We're in a recession. Like we <laughs> we are in a recession. Good morning. This is the floating rock we live on. Welcome to the America that we live in. Celebritism, you know, the fascination with that level of visibility and with, you know, that lifestyle is not new. Even when it comes to professional sports. And here's the thing. I do think the influencing content creation discussion has become kind of gendered in a way like there's a there's a gendered undertone where it's like oh like all these girls want to do is like post pictures of them in the gym outfits and like and with their smoothies and it's like okay first of all that's one very specific area of the internet so please know the medium second of all why is it that becoming a professional athlete is not as frowned upon why is it that that's not as stigmatized as influencing is it because it's a is, is it because influencing is a a female dominated feels right now? Is that why? And I, I do wonder because y'all weren't complaining about Tom Brady. He makes more than a doctor does a year. And let me let me pull this up. Let me pull this up. And there there are lots of articles that I'm not going to get to today because there's just so much going on. Here is the operative list at this moment or I think as at least as of 2020 of professions that make more than doctors do a year. By the way, the publication that released this article is men's XP. So they're not even in denial about it. Yes, so social media influencers are on that list. Specific kinds of influencers who are making more money than doctors. And yes, I'm going to get to that. CEOs of large corporations. Athletes are number three on that list. But yeah, it's an over $500 billion industry. That's an exact, you know, that's not just me throwing that number out there. That's a recorded number. Over $500 billion in that industry. Athletes are making a ton of money. <clears throat> not 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 to say that just because the industry is making a ton of money, the athletes are making a ton of money. Because, you know, some of that goes to managers, some of that goes to, 
you know, just a lot of things. Those and things so, wouldn't necessarily be, in, be linked, but you got some of these players making $5 million a, a year. Also on that list, really big film stars, politicians. And yeah, that concludes this list. And I really am not trying to yell at y'all. Like, I'm not trying to yell. I have a microphone right here. I don't need to yell. But, um... Yeah, we can't ignore that this discussion does feel very gendered. It also does feel very ageist. I think I think um, a lot of people who are kind of in this moral panic, as, I, as I'm calling it, are older generations claiming that, you know, Gen Z or younger generations are getting lazy, but ignoring the very harsh realities of the workforce right now and of living in America and not being in the top 1%. The very harsh realities of that, um, especially with, you know, lack of health care. And yeah, it's hard out here. So which kind of influencers are actually making all this money are actually making millions of dollars a year? Influencing slash content creating is harder than people realize. It's not just, you know, you, you can cater to the lifestyle that you have and make it efficient for you and make it work for you. But it is being a CEO, it's owning a business if you do it right. If you do it in a way that actually gains you income. You're putting in hours, you're learning different things, you're learning how to edit, you're staying with the with the trends, you're learning all these different mechanisms, you're learning, you know, how to read your analytics, you're learning how to sell your business or how to sell yourself, how to sell your brand, right? Um yeah, it's not just you showing up and taking pictures. But anyway, so I decided to look up who are the most paid influencers. Yeah. And what I've come to find is a lot of them are, and I'm going to put, you know, the list that I was, was looking at in the description box. But a lot of these people come from affluent lifestyles and are selling this sort of aspirational wealth, poolside views or the vacationing or the expensive clothing and or at, at the very least the expensive looking clothing i don't know what the real eyes are like because some of them are grifters like <laughs> like some of them are grifters and uh, hey i i support a hustler i support a hustler i support a good marketer i'm not mad at you but um they are selling this lifestyle that most people find it really difficult or even impossible to obtain and so that uh, that in itself means that they have some sort of privilege, right? To be able to go on these private jets, to be able to visit these islands in the, you know. There are certain aesthetics that sell well to brands specifically. And the aesthetics that sell well to brands are the aesthetics that brands think are going to be aspirational. It's kind of like what I was talking about in that White Hot and, you know, the Netflix White Hot video that I talked about in another episode where I was talking about how whiteness is often attributed to being cool. And the more closer you are to whiteness, the more aligned you are with that those beauty standards, you know, the thin nose, the small waist, the, the slim hips, the more you are going to be perceived as cool. And nowadays, I, I think that we're entering a wave of that becoming even more obvious. I think that we are exiting out of the wave of the mixed fetish, of the mixed aesthetic. And I think that we are, or not we, not me. I think that brands, large brands, are starting to favor more the really thin, the really Eurocentric beauty features now. I, think. I don't think either of those waves <laughs> is helpful. I mean, I guess. I I don't know. I just, I don't like, I don't like either of them. I don't like what's, what's happening in either case. I also think that black people, as we start to pursue, you know, as we start to become influencers, we need to become really Not real that. white influencers or white adjacent influencers are going to be getting more clout, are going to, be, going to probably be reached out more than we are for doing the same, doing the same level of stuff. And what I think we need to start doing with that knowledge is making higher bids, is asking for more money, because if we collectively do that, then we're kind of using their, the businesses, the large businesses and brands, their desire for diversity, for representation. We're kind of using that at our advantage. So that is my challenge to us for this Black History Month and ongoing, you know? I want us to bid higher. I want us to 
to ask for more because they do need us. They do need their little representation point. And I would really challenge us to harness our buyer power as well because black dollars be making mountains move. They do. So I would really challenge us to pay attention to where we're spending our money. You know, though this brand has had, you know, one black influencer representing them in the last five years, let's look at the brands who have been doing it even before the big wave of representation became popular. As I close, I think it's important for non-black influencers in the space to acknowledge the privilege that they had, to acknowledge how taking a trend that you see a black person do can make you blow up, but that black person becomes invisible. I need us to tag people in the descriptions. I need us to tag people in the comment sections. I need us to tag people in the captions where we get our ideas from. Because you know, now you know that that person of color or that black person specifically is not going to get as recognized as you are. It's not gonna get paid as much for the same brand deals, for the same amount of work that you are. Acknowledge that when you're in that space. Acknowledge that. And even people who are working with those companies, people working on the branding side, on the influencer strategy side, I really want you to harness your power and to go out of your way to seek other kinds of representation, to seek influencers who that company is not used to working with. Because honestly, it's just gonna make your business better. And I'm about out of words for this episode. I didn't get to cover everything. Also, Jalea Harmon, who doesn't nearly make as much as Charlie Charlie D'Amelio, originated the content that really allowed Charlie to skyrocket. And, And you can't deny that. You can't deny that. Also, here's what I will close with. You really want more doctors? If you really want more doctors, let's make education less inaccessible. Let's make higher education not literally put people into years and years and years and years of debt that they almost may never recover from. Like, let's try that. Let's try making public school systems that cater to disabled people, that cater to children of color, and make it so that multiple types of brains are catered to and are allowed to thrive. How about that? Don't talk to me about there not being enough doctors. Don't talk to me about influencers becoming too prevalent if you don't want to talk about the public education system. Okay, we can just put that to bed. Thank you. All right, that's all the time I have for today. I've been talking for a really long time, but I think it was all stuff that I needed to get off my chest. Please like, share, and subscribe. Join the Patreon if you like what I'm saying to you. And stay weird.